Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. You want to see how hip I am? Watch this. I was twerking. How do you like that? We're doing the Constitution for Dummy series, guys, taking a look at the 18th Amendment. We're going to take the words, we're going to chop it up, and we're going to serve it on a plate of learning. So go grab a knife and fork and sit down, because I hope you're hungry. Here we go. Get the light. Doing the moonwalking. All right, you know how this works, guys. Let's put the music on, a little soft, nice music, maestro. The 18th Amendment. Section 1. After one year from the ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within, the importation thereof into, or the exportation thereof from the United States, and all the territory subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. Section 2. The Congress of the several states shall have concurrent power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Section 3. This article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution by the legislatures of the several states, as provided in the Constitution, within seven years from the date of this submission hereof to the states by the Congress. So, if you want it broken down in its most basic way, this is the prohibition of booze, guys. The easiest way to remember this, we have to get the stupid out of the way first, is just to remember kind of the old drinking age in American history. Um, you know, in the early 80s, and the 1970s, before that, you had to be 18 years old to drink. So 18 always reminds me of the drinking concept. So I know that 18 is prohibition. And guess what the repeal of prohibition is? Mr. Hughes, it couldn't be 21. That would be too easy. It's 21. So 18 and 21, we'll do 21 in a different lecture. So let's take a look a little bit at the meaning behind those words if it's the prohibition of booze. Where does that come from? And then we'll take a look at the Volstead Act, which is going to be the teeth behind that amendment. I didn't know that amendments had teeth. Sometimes we do teeth. Alright, so holy rollers, baby. If we're looking at the 18th Amendment and the prohibition of booze, we're definitely looking at uh, the temperance movement. Temperance means moderation, and really when we're looking at the temperance movement, we're going back to the late 1700s, early 19th centuries, and the first wave of the temperance movement, which is really kind of a Protestant uh, kind of religious thing, where, um, you know, you have to remember that uh, as alcohol gets more potent, and especially in the early 1800s with kind of uh, the whiskey thing going on, um, the people that see the uh, kind of the effects of booze are generally the women of the household, and they don't get to vote. So the people that are voting are the people that are drinking, and the people that are drinking are the people that are, you know, causing havoc in society. And as we have kind of a increase in immigration in the 1830s and the 1840s before the Civil War, the temperance movement really kind of uh, blossoms and grows. Um, and I think that it kind of, you know, merges a little bit with the abolitionist movement and the progressive movement later on, with this kind of like, you know, the seeking of using government power to curb kind of evil influences and to fix problems. And uh, we'll take a little deeper look at that after the Civil War, but the Civil War is going to put the nookie on the temperance movement, that's for sure. So let's take a look at the second wave, then the third wave, and then BAM! To the event. So after the Civil War, we see kind of an increase in the temperance movement and getting into a little bit of more kind of political behavior, again with emergence of progressivism, and this time really with the women's suffrage movement. Um, supporters of the temperance movement include Elizabeth Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, so there's definitely kind of emergence of kind of the religious arm of temperance with more of the progressive arm of women's suffrage. Um, but the Women's Christian Temperance Union under Francis Willard becomes kind of a strong political force. So by the turn of the century, as we get closer to World War I, we see an increase in these temperance movements getting political, and this becomes the Anti-Saloon League. The Anti-Saloon League, which was run by Wayne Wheeler, is probably one of the most powerful lobby groups the United States has ever seen. When you look at the allies of the Anti-Saloon League, it just makes your head go... <laughs> you got the KKK supporting Wayne Wheeler and the NAACP. Right? You have the IWW. You know about the IWW, the International Workers of the World? Look at that. These guys are radicals, man. They pop a daisy, right? And who are they in bed with? They're hooking up with 
with Andrew Carnegie, the industrialist, right? So you have Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and populists. You have racists and African Americans all behind Wayne Wheeler. And this need to really, in the eyes of these groups, stop alcoholism. You know, um, people drink three times as much as they do today back in the day. So this is creating havoc in cities and on families. And with women getting the right to vote soon, and women being high in temperance a little bit, with World War I going on, and kind of this anti-German fever, kind of the German brewery, and, you know, if you want to defeat the Germans, you got to stop drinking. Um, and also with the 16th Amendment. The 16th Amendment, which is income tax, happened a few years before this, so that alleviates some of kind of the uh, worry that politicians are going to have about revenue sources. So instead of taxing liquor, because we're not going to be able to do that, we're going to be taxing uh, income, right? So there you go. I think it's kind of all of these factors that kind of are rolled up into one um, that create the momentum and the political uh, noogieing that goes on for the 18th Amendment. All right, let's take a look at the 18th Amendment and the enforcement of it so we can put some teeth in that tiger because words are just words. So if you look at the actual words of the 18th Amendment, there's nothing in there that says you can't drink. All it does in Section 1 is it prohibits the manufacturing, the sale, and the transportation of intoxicating liquors. It's kind of really kind of broad and, and fuzzy. So we go back to our guy, Wayne Wheeler. Guess who writes the law to enforce the 18th Amendment? You got it. It's the Anti-Saloon League. They literally write the Volstead Act. The Volstead Act is uh, named after the House Judiciary Committee guy who wrote the law with the Anti-Saloon League. Um, but the Volstead Act is the teeth of the 18th Amendment. So number one, it's going to kind of define what intoxicating liquors are. And it says 0.5% alcohol. So if it was 0.5% alcohol, it was then an intoxicating liquor. And the sale and the manufacturing and the transportation of it was banned. Um, interestingly enough, the IRS got into the business of defining what the 0.5% was. And when it came to wine, um, and homemade wine especially, they refused to do that. So during Prohibition, it was legal to drink homemade wine, or at least to manufacture it. It was never illegal to drink it in the first place. Um, but basically, the idea behind the Volstead Act is to cut off the manufacturing of alcohol so it won't be available. Um, is it going to be a success? Well, obviously not because we're going to reverse this uh, 1933 with the 21st Amendment. You can watch that video down the road. The Volstead Act also had exceptions in terms of industrial use of alcohol or intoxicating liquors, um, religious use of liquors, and scientific use of intoxicating liquors. So by no means is liquor or intoxicating liquors off the shelf. It's really just being regulated by the government. And of course, if you're going to take private industry out of it, Right? Who's going to fill it but illegal industry? And of course, we're going to see the rise of the Chicago mob and mobs in Detroit and across the country and prostitution and uh, violence and shootings and yada, yada, yada. That should be for the 21st Amendment. The Volstead Act also put the kind of the time frame on when the 18th Amendment was going to be enforced. And that was put on the date of January 17, 1920, the earliest possible date that the 18th Amendment allowed for. Interestingly enough, the Volstead Act was also vetoed by Woodrow Wilson, mainly for technical reasons, but he, that was a veto that was overridden in the House and the Senate. It just goes to show you either how popular the Volstead Act and the 18th Amendment really was, or how popular or powerful the anti-saloon was as a lobby. So there you go, right? All right, let's hear it. Raise it to the roof for learning. Make sure you check out other video lectures, guys. If you click my face right here, we'll go to the homepage of YouTube's Infuse History, and you can check out over 200 video lectures. And check out the description below, guys. We have tons of other EDU channels that you should be watching, too, because there's only so many cat videos that you can watch on YouTube before your brain's going to be itching for some learning. All right, guys, where attention goes, energy flows. Right now, my attention's over there.